It is a pleasure, a pleasure to be here, and uh, I've really enjoyed being part of Future Places, so thanks for inviting me. Um, as Fatima said, I'm Paul Stacy. I'm from Vancouver, Canada, so I've come, uh, actually, we were, Fatima and I were in Seoul together last week, so um, this is my second week on the road. Um, by way of background, here's a little snippet of some of the activities that I've been doing which sort of feed into what I want to talk about with all of you today. Um, I've been at Creative Commons for a number of years now, and most of my work has been in the open educational resources space, but I've also been doing quite a bit of work at the policy level and as uh, part of the Institute for Open Leadership. But this, this year, I decided to start a new initiative at Creative Commons which looks at a thorny question which we always get asked, which is you know, how do creators earn a living and sustain themselves if they're openly licensing their work with Creative Commons and giving it away for free on the internet? And I think this is probably a question that many of you have in your minds too as we've seen creators uh, start to earn less and less money um, as we've heard some people already talk about at this event, and my interest is in open business models that actually generate more money for creators and less money perhaps for the middlemen and distributors and record labels and so on. So um, a colleague and I ran a Kickstarter campaign back in uh, the summer, and we raised some funds to write a book about open business models where the business is based on Creative Commons. And when I was speaking to Heiter and Fatima about uh, participating and giving this keynote, um, one of the phone calls we had, or Skype calls we had, uh, Heiter was glum, I think, about world news and some of the things that are happening around the world. And, and yet, every time we talked about future places, it was in a really positive, happy way. And uh, I, I decided to base this keynote on imagining a sort of future place where we all are global citizens in a global commons. And two factors really affected how I decided to approach this. One was that uh, this year it became really apparent to me that uh, one of the unique things about Creative Commons is that it empowers us all to take self-action. I think most of the time we look to our government to take care of society and culture and ourselves or our workplace and the companies and organizations we work for to, uh, to support us and help us make a living. But I'm increasingly seeing a third way, which is the ability for all of us to make some decisions that enable ourselves and enable the rest of the world to, to thrive. So I wanted to talk about uh, activities tonight that really are things that all of us can do. And some of the, the sh and I wasn't aware that we'd be doing it in quite a theater like this, but the sheet of paper was, um, was something that I wanted to invite you all to kind of work on throughout this keynote. And there'll be moments in time when I actually stop talking and invite you to uh, put down your own thoughts on that sheet of paper. And then the last um, sort of thematic element for me for this keynote is the idea of abundance. Uh, we always uh, historically have been talking about in terms of the world and the economics and the marketplace, scarcity. Almost everything we do in terms of the economy is based on economics that are around scarcity. And when we shift the conversation to speak about abundance, a whole new way of thinking and new sets of models start to emerge. So most of my keynote tonight will focus on ideas around abundance. So what I wanted to do was uh, look at an interactive session um, that has us all imagine ourselves as global citizens, so somewhat independent from our state or country or nation, uh, ability to make decisions on the basis of how they affect the whole world, not just our particular community or country, and in a sense work towards a global good, um, to set aside some of the market economics way of thinking about things where value is placed on maximizing money, and instead look at how we might actually 
uh, do social good that makes use of the abundance all around us. And that includes kind of ending in the digital media context some of the artificial scarcity that we tend to place on digital goods. So I'm very much going to be looking at how we create benefits through sharing and through building a global commons, and I'll be inviting you to think about how you might use your skills and experience to actually uh, enable the world to um, be a better place than it is now. So um, when I put this together, I decided I'd do this across a number of dimensions. And so the, the page you have in front of you uh, shows a diagram that I use to kind of organize my thinking. And I'll talk about the commons and how we might think about ourselves in the commons across each of these dimensions. So the physical dimension, the digital dimension, locally, globally, from a knowledge point of view, from a data point of view, and culturally and creatively. So let me jump right in. On the physical side, there's a lot of uh, reimagining the commons. As you probably all know, historically there was a commons that was the basis of society. We didn't used to all own private property. It was held in common, and we would organize ourselves to make the best use of that property and to manage it as a commons. And that notion is starting to resurface in contemporary thinking, including ideas around the city as a commons and reimagining the city as an urban space made up of common goods where the government actually organizes itself and manages the city as an urban commons. And so uh, there's been a really great book by Jonathan Rowe written about this called Our Commonwealth, which looks at the things like sidewalks and streets as common areas that we all have access to and we all can use without exclusion. And it, and it explores the notion that those common areas are in fact what fuels the economy, even though we think of them as sort of um, givens. And so the, uh, the new kind of urban commons is looking at reconceiving the city in terms of a commons, thinking about it as a place where social innovation can happen, where there can be greater participation of citizens in terms of shaping the, na the, nation of, the notion of the city, and even in terms of designing and governing the city. So I've been really pleased actually to see some of the sessions and citizen labs at this event focus on things like uh, sort of uh, design and uh, thinking about the city, even um, the report out earlier today about a city that is subject to global warming where the water starts to rise. What happens then? Um, these are a few pictures from Vancouver where I live and I just wanted to show a couple of examples of how the people in Vancouver are approaching this. Um, people are starting to actually garden city streets so the top picture is like a roundabout in the middle of the city where the neighbors are actually the ones that are planting the, the, um, the flowers and plants in that roundabout and starting to maintain and care for it themselves, including not just the roundabouts, but sometimes the, uh, the, the kind of walk, the walkway areas between the sidewalk and the street, as you can see in the bottom photo. And another big part of Vancouver right now is the whole idea that the city wants to be the greenest city in the world. And one of the things this has led to is the better utilization of space in the city. The city's actually fairly small and compact because it has huge mountains to the north and then the ocean sort of on, on all, all the other sides. And so the only way it can go is up. And so there's lots of, as you can see in the background here, lots of high rises. And what's starting to happen is that there's a lot of urban planning around utilization of the roof for growing things, to grow vegetables and food for the people living in the city. And so lots of rooftop gardens as a new, in a sense, a new abundant space that isn't very often fully utilized and can be utilized to create some real significant benefits for citizens. And this leads me to another thing that I've been uh, interested in finding um, ideas around, which is how we make better use of things like gardens and spaces. And uh, so there's this really cool initiative. It actually started in Australia called Shared Earth. It's essentially a website that helps people who have land to share tell people that they have land to share and invite other people who are gardeners to actually come 
and maintain the land and garden that land and essentially there's a sharing of the, uh, the produce that results from that. So on the one hand you've got someone who has earth but maybe not the time to garden it and you've got others who are gardeners and are keen to actually use that earth and uh, plant and grow things and a sharing of the resulting produce. Also really fascinating over the last years as Monsanto has increasingly patented seeds are initiatives like the Open Source Seed Initiative, which is looking to ensure that seeds remain kind of shareable, freely distributable. In a sense, a seed is a form of abundance as it can replicate itself and it can grow into new plants, which then also yield seeds. And so really seeds are a fantastic um, representation of abundance. And yet, um, as we increasingly start to patent seeds, uh, that abundance starts to uh, be at risk. So um, initiatives like the Open Source Seed Initiative are all about trying to maintain the abundance and ability of seeds to be a source of livelihood for farmers and a source of food for us all. I mentioned that I was just in Seoul and Seoul did a really interesting thing. They removed a uh, eight-lane freeway that went right through the middle of the city. And when they did that, uh, one of the things they realized is that prior to that freeway, there was a river there. And so they renaturalized that space to allow the river to return. And it's now become one of the most popular areas in the whole city. So people are really valuing having in the middle of a city a green space, essentially a canal with a river running through it and walkways on both sides that they can walk along and have some uh, some uh, both experience of living things, but also the sound of the water. Very soothing, especially in a city with something like 13 million people. So this is where I turn it, I'm gonna take a minute to stop talking and actually invite you on your design template to identify one physical space that through self-action you could make into a shared commons around where you live and one space that you wish your government made into some sort of public commons. If you don't have a pen, you can just think about it. And I'm gonna play a little tune while you're thinking. That's the physical um, side of things, and I wanted to switch from that side to think about the digital space, which I know all of you are deeply immersed in. And we too are deeply immersed in that at Creative Commons, where really, of course, the internet made it technically easy to share everything, but of course, legally not so easy, as you've all heard about you know, notions of piracy and takedown notices. And so one of the things Creative Commons has tried to do is make it possible for anyone to legally share materials. And as a result, we're starting to see things like open textbooks in the education space. And I've been finding it pretty interesting to look at the economic side of that. So if you look at what it costs to take, say, a 250-page textbook and make a copy of that on your computer, you can see that it's fractions of a cent. And the same with distributing that textbook. So basically, copying and distributing something like a textbook, and even storing it, is starting to approach zero dollars. And that partly is aided by the fact that computer processing speeds, storage, bandwidth, um, all of those are doubling about every 18 months. And so it's interesting then to look at how the textbooks are actually being marketed. And so here we can see the costs associated with a typical physics textbook where if you were to buy that book as a hard copy book new, it would cost about $240, this is in US dollars. And then right below that you can see what it costs to buy an e-version of that textbook, $155. So we know that it costs almost zero 
dollars to actually copy, store, and distribute that book. And so that's an incredible markup on something that is actually almost free in terms of how it could be costed for the publisher. Of course, there's the upfront cost of actually writing the book and um, you know, kind of laying it out and designing it. But once that's done, uh, then the actual cost to, to distribute it should be, or ought to be, much lower than that. And so there's this whole notion that with digital goods, we're creating what, what increasingly is being called artificial scarcity. There's no reason for it to be scarce, but we make it scarce. And we make it scarce because we want to make money on it. And so there's all the digital rights management software applications that are increasingly managing digital goods. And there's lots of people protesting the fact that often now when you get an e-textbook, let's say for school, it's for a fixed time period and actually expires once the course is done. So notions like that are actually changing the whole idea of what a book is. Which leads me to some of the exploration I'm doing with the um, open business model work around traditional market economics. And some of you were in the workshop I did uh, earlier this week, and we talked about this in more detail. And I won't go into all the detail here. Simply to say, though, that traditional market economics, the way we all, all of our governments and all of business operates, is essentially about maximizing monetary value. So if you have uh, resources that are needed to produce something, who gets those resources depends on who can pay the most money for them. And then once you've manufactured a good, you want to sell it, who gets that good is based on who's willing to pay the most money for it. This whole idea of maximizing monetary value doesn't actually work in the same way in the context of abundance. So if you have something that's free or costs essentially zero dollars and you make it available to everybody, then actually all of those resources can be made available to everybody without any kind of law, you know, with, without any need to maximize the monetary value. And something like a digital good can be shared, of course, uh, without being scarce, so that if I give you a copy of a digital good, I still have that copy, and now you have a copy, and we both have copies. That's very different than a physical-based resource. This whole exploration of sharing in the digital economy is something that Creative Commons has been very, very active in. And I just thought I'd throw this up to show sort of the range of activities that we've been engaged in. I've been doing a lot of work in the education space, especially around open educational resources, which are, which are course materials or textbooks or animations. Uh, FET is a simulations for physics, uh, concepts, biology, those in anatomy and physiology, those are open textbooks. Also in the education space are a whole sort of open sharing of research. And so in the bottom left corner you see two research journals that are, that are essentially places where faculty can publish their work in a way where it becomes openly accessible to everybody. Even the library makes these resources available for free without having to pay a subscription fee to the publisher. And there's this whole idea with the open access and with open education resources that usage of public taxpayers' dollars should result in works that the public has access to. The idea that if you use taxpayers' dollars to produce a resource, which then the public actually has to pay for to get access to, seems a little bit dicey. So on the education side, you've got educational resources and you've got research and also open data. Um, on the top there, you see open data from Figshare. That can be open data pertaining to research, but it could also be open data pertaining to, let's say, government data that's being collected on our behalf. And, and should the government actually make that data available openly to us? Other areas that we've been very heavily involved with on the digital side are down in the bottom right. Uh, the whole GLAM sector, sector, which is galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, where lots of those organizations are increasingly making their digital collections openly licensed with Creative Commons and freely available to us all to benefit from. And then you have um, things like YouTube and Flickr and SoundCloud, which are sources of either photos or videos or music, where the artists can choose to uh, license them with Creative Commons and make those resources freely available to all of us. So lots and lots of sectors now are using Creative Commons to increasingly make digital resources free and open. And it used to be in the old days that Creative Commons was largely a sort of grassroots initiative 
where individuals were choosing to use the licenses, but increasingly we're seeing sort of a top-down part to this where government is also starting to, th to take the initiative to freely share the works that it funds. So let me take a moment here again to just give you a moment to think about this. If you were to take personal action on your design template, what digital resources do you have that could potentially be openly licensed and made part of the global commons? Time for the musical interlude. context of the commons, uh, a lot of work was done originally by Eleanor Ostrom, who won a Nobel Prize for her work on the commons. And uh, all of her work, though, was done on the basis of looking at physical, natural, resource-based commons. But nonetheless, uh, there's incredible insights that she was able to express and to lay down in terms of how natural res resource-based commons typically operated in the past. And authors like David Bollier have since come along and done a good job about describing what it's like to think like a commoner, to think differently instead of just about uh, what's mine and how to maximize what I have, to instead think about the commons and how to benefit everybody collectively. And so um, if you look at someone like Ostrom's uh, work, she published an analysis and design framework that looks something like this where on the far left you have the biophysical characteristics of the commons resources, and then you have the attributes of the community that uses those resources, which creates some rules around how it shall be used. And then you get into the actual what actually happens. And so if you're in Switzerland, for example, where perhaps you're putting uh, animals out to pasture in the alpine area, then that becomes an action situation where the the community and the actors involved have to decide how many of the cattle can go up into the alpine and what are the, you know, who gets to put how many uh, out to pasture for a particular uh, period of time. And, and, and the results, a whole set of patterns of interaction, a whole set of outcomes that get evaluated annually over and over again. The rules may change, they're not always the same. And so um, she sort of laid the groundwork for how to think about a commons and how to design and analyze one. But then we moved into the internet age and the digital commons really changed things because with the physical commons, we do have scarcity, right? So if you have something like a forest, then if, if, if I cut down that tree, then you know the, the, that particular tree is something that I've now got the resources from it, and you can't, you don't have them. So it becomes a, a kind of um, competitive environment where, where none of us can have all of the resources available to, to ourselves. But, but as we know with the digital commons, things are non-rivalrous. There really isn't the sense or the need necessarily for us to create rivalry. You can't really deplete the digital commons, not unless you create artificial scarcity. And, and at the same time, digital commons can be both local, like a physical commons, in, the, in terms of sharing resources here with, with ourselves in this immediate region, but it also, as soon as you put it out on the internet, becomes something that's global. It's been very interesting, actually, to work in the education space around this, because you get governments funding the creation of open, shareable education resources but they tend to think mostly about their nation or their region and their citizens without really thinking about the global potential and impact that those resources might have around the world. So the digital commons really does look at uh, empowering individuals to take action without necessarily getting approval or um, uh, a mandate to do so from government or from their business and, and can result in works that are non-rivalrous that become not only local but global. 
On the local side, um, I, I wanted to share again a little bit about Seoul. I uh, just came back from there, and it was a really very fascinating place to be. And Seoul has, uh, wanted to, has established itself as what it calls a sharing city. And this whole notion of being a sharing city is starting to spread now. Um, so we're starting to see other cities also aspire to this, but Seoul was one of the first to do so. So they're deliberately looking at what does the city have in its local sort of regional area that could be better utilized. So the whole strategy is around how do you maximize and make better use of the resources you already have. So they're looking at sp the space, they're looking at skills and experience and time. They're looking at goods. They're looking at content. They're looking at all of those things. So from the space side, for example, they're looking at how do they take idle spaces that perhaps aren't used seven days a week or perhaps aren't used you know, as, for as many hours during the day as they could be and make better use of those spaces? Or how do they take office space, which often is used from nine to five but then not used at all after those hours and make better use of that space? Same with parking spaces. They actually have a whole person, a whole team of people dedicated and a set of apps now dedicated to helping people find and make better use of the parking spaces that are available. On the goods, and, and interestingly, actually, um, Seoul has uh, not allowed Uber. So if you think about transportation and the role that, um, that companies like Uber are playing, it's interesting to, to see the, some cities not going with that, but instead creating their own um, methods for uh, things, creating sh sharing services around things like cars. And they're also creating sharing services around a lot just cars, but all kinds of other goods, including clothes and performance equipment, like the equipment on this stage. So I I'll take a moment break again to just invite you to think about what existing local ro resources in your region could be more effectively utilized as a source of abundance, and usually as a means of solving some sort of social issue that exists in your region? I won't play the music this time, but let's take a second. So I'm going to switch from global to local, or from local to global, rather. Um, so in the global commons, all of us are aware of many of the existing resources that, that are being built out as a commons, like Wikipedia, like WikiHow, which is trying to create resources to help anyone learn anything. But I wanted to share with you my own personal experience on the global level. And I think this has some corollaries, actually, with some of the academic programs here. But I did a graduate degree that was 100% online. It's called Adult Learning and Global Change. And the, there's some interesting aspects to this degree. One is that it involves a partnership of four different universities around the world. A university in Sweden, Lynn Chipping, one in Australia, Monash, the one that I enrolled in in Canada at the University of British Columbia, and a, a fourth one in Africa at the University of Western Cape. So there's a few things that are interesting about this, this program. One is that students can enroll it through any of those four universities. And also, it's interesting, of course, to have universities in the Northern Hemisphere and universities in the Southern Hemisphere. Because as soon as you start to add universities in the Southern Hemisphere, it really changes the culture and practice of what actually takes place. And the way that the graduate program worked, as, as I said, it was 100% online, but the actual responsibility for teaching particular courses in the graduate degree rotates from institution to institution. So maybe the first course, Locating Oneself in Global Learning, is taught by the university in Canada, and the second course is taught by the university in Sweden, and the third course from Africa, fourth course from Australia, and so on. And the students all have enrolled through all four universities and form a cohort that stays together for the entire time. So this whole idea that you could have a program 
that is made up of multiple universities from all around the world and have that program be shared from a teaching and learning perspective and have the student pool be shared so that it's not all students from the same region but students from all around the world that are en enrolled in this course as a cohort was a pretty powerful thing because you ended up getting exposed to not only the pedagogy and practices of ways of teaching and learning from around the world but also the personal lives of the other students that you were t you, that you were enrolled in, or enrolled with. So you got to hear about the news and politics and the daily lives and the work and the personal issues of all of your fellow students from all around the world, which really creates for a very powerful kind of uh, experience. And then there was one last thing about this program that was very um, that was totally unexpected, at least when I decided to take this program. And that is that the, as a 100% online program, uh, of course, you never met. And, and yet it was very social, and perhaps more social and more interactive than any course I ever took on campus. But the students decided that they did want to meet. And the cohort before mine decided to organize a meetup in Africa. And so all the students enrolled in the program at the time were invited to go to Africa on a particular date for a week. And about 15 went, and they had a fantastic time, and they decided to do that again every other year. And so the year I enrolled, it was taking place in Canada, and so I thought, oh, I'll go and participate in this and see what it's like. And, and interestingly, it was entirely organized by the students, and the students would um, organize site visits to places of adult learning in, their, in that particular country. And so it ended up being a mix of a social time when you got to meet the other students and interact with them at a per, on a personal level, but you also actually got to experience that country by visiting sites of adult learning. Instead of going to a museum or a church, you'd go and see how the adult education is done in that particular country. And this has continued on. So I've actually now uh, been to um, what's called the Adult Learning and Global Change Institute that the students actually organize. I've been to the one in Sweden. I've been to the one in Africa and Australia. And I've been to two of them now in Canada. And so it's ended up forming this incredible network of social bonds and a professional learning network that has continued the learning associated with that degree program on a global level well beyond the time past my graduation. This for me is actually one of the more interesting examples of how we can think about ourselves as global citizens in a global commons, and not just as a citizen in our particular country, but one that is part of the entire world. So I'd like you to think again about how you might participate in a global citizen way in what you do. I will play the music again. I like this music. I'm going to switch now to culture. This has been a really fascinating area for me to explore in my work at Creative Commons. I came out of the education and high tech space, so I spent half my career in the private sector working in high tech companies, both startups and huge ones, and the other half of my career kind of working in education. And when I came to Creative Commons, a significant part of our effort has been focused around the libraries and the museums that exist around the world and encouraging them to look at their collections as something that should be made available publicly as a common good for everyone to benefit from and to experience and see. And this has actually been increasingly pursued and adopted by ga galleries and libraries and museums as they digitize their collections. And so you have initiatives like Europeana which is really trying to aggregate collections from across multiple libraries and museums and make them available digitally for all of us to access. And you can see in the bottom left corner that they, they use the Creative Commons licenses to make those resources available for us so that we can 
reuse and remix them if we wish. In North America, uh, in the United States, we have the Digital Public Library of America, which, which also acts in a similar fashion to Europeana, with the ex with this, except that it does it for libraries. So it essentially aggregates library collections, digital library collections from across many of the libraries in, in uh, the United States and aggregates them into one single platform where you can come to do a single search for any particular book and find that book and access it digitally. I also thought that what the Rijksmuseum did in the Netherlands was pretty interesting. Uh, they initially started to digitize uh, significant parts of their collection and they offered sort of two versions of the digital work, a low resolution version which you could have for free and a high resolution version which you would have to pay money for. Um, and they started to, um, to make some money from selling the high res version but decided eventually to actually make even the high res version available for free online under a Creative Commons uh, license. And, and not only that, but they actually encouraged commercial use of those works and created the Reich's Studio, which we see here, which allows you to take those high-res digital works and make things like a poster out of them or use them for whatever you want. And so now we're starting to see uh, some pretty interesting and entrepreneurial uses of um, aspects of the Rijksmuseum's collection, including things like uh, putting the works on clothing, for example, which is then sold. And so the whole idea that a museum can, can serve not only a curatorial and a cultural um, service for the citizens, but also as a stimulus to the economy by sharing its work is sort of a new whole area and a new role for these organizations that they didn't historically have. There's also the potential role that they can take in terms of creating places for their works to be used in the public context. So here we're seeing works from uh, the Danish Museum, the Statens for Kunst, that is uh, allowing some of its works to be made in murals that are being put on walls where where uh, the public walks by all the time as a means of uh, increasing the artistic and creative enjoyment of their works in a public context. So uh, again, I wanted to invite you to think about whether you have cultural work yourself that you would see that could be made open and shared, or whether you think that your cultural institutions have work that should be open and shared. And if so, to, to kind of jot a few notes down on your, your paper to identify what those things might be. I know this is a space that all of you are really engaged in, the creative space. Um, and my kids are really engaged in this space too. This is a, my son does 3D visual work for the, for the video game industry. This is one of his works. And as, as I expect many of you know, lots and lots of other creators have decided to digitize their work and make it available under open Creative Commons licenses. This is Flickr, the photo sharing site, which has millions of photos that have been openly licensed with Creative Commons. And I talked about this one during the workshop and nobody had heard about it before, so I decided to also mention it here. Um, this is the Noun Project, which makes uh, little visual icons and symbols, and they actually have um, enlisted creators from around the world. They have 7,000 designers from all around the world who contribute these symbols to the Noun Project. Any, they're all openly licensed and available for free under a Creative Commons license, so you can go and download any of these icons and make use of them in the work that you're doing. The only requirement, of course, is that you 
give attribution to the creator and acknowledge their original work. Um, but if you don't want to give attribution, then you pay. So they have a very interesting business model. They're free as long as you give attribution. If you don't want to give attribution, then you actually have to pay. And so the, they've kind of uh, integrated the use of the Creative Commons license right into the heart of their business model and tried to devise a means by which um, the creators can get some compensation. And, and they're just getting going, but I was speaking to them the other day because we are really thinking about profiling them for our book, and I was asking them, so how much money do the creators actually make? And, and so uh, they talk about it in three tiers. Uh, they talk about it as beer money. They make enough money to buy beer. Uh, bill money, they make more money, enough money to pay the bills. Or rent money, they actually make significant money, enough to pay their rent every month. Um, they don't have yet anyone that's actually sort of fully making an entire living off of these icons. But, but they're starting to get there. And then we're seeing a huge explosion of work being done in the 3D space. And I expect some of you are involved in this space as well. So the whole idea of designing things in 3D, which can then be manufactured, whether through a 3D printer or through laser cutting or through CNC. And, and again, in this space, we're also seeing lots of people making their 3D designs available openly as part of the global commons for others to make use of and to customize. And so we're sort of moving from this whole mass manufacturing kind of idea to the ability of people to take 3D designs that are being openly shared, customize them, and then custom print, some, uh, print or manufacture something that specifically suits their particular needs. You want a table that's 10 inches higher, you can design that table and get it manufactured specifically to your needs. Uh, we're also seeing these 3D designs being used to create assistive technology for people who are handicapped or are less well abled than we are. Another kind of creative use of uh, works is happening in the music space. Um, this is an interesting area in terms of the business models. Uh, this is Tribe of Noise here in Europe that uh, allows people to put up music on their platform. You can actually put it up in the community space under a Creative Commons license where it's freely accessible and free to others, or you can put it up in a pro space and actually sell that to make money. And, um, and so f there's actually many of these platforms. And um, in my open business models work, I'm trying to look at all these different plat platforms and see to what extent are they the same or different, and to what extent are the creators actually benefiting from these sites? Because I'm really, really keen to, th to find models which benefit the creator in a significant way. I actually think we're seeing more and more music and more and more musicians participating in the music space, but are they actually generating funds that allow them to survive and sustain their practice and make a living? This is the part that I'm really starting to dig in now. And then you have some, um, some people like uh, Cory Doctorow, a popular science fiction writer who uh, publishes all his books under a Creative Commons license. You can download any of his books from Craphound, and they're all free in a digital form. But of course, he also sells his books as physical books. And so it's, it's not an either or choice. You don't actually have to just go open and free or only closed and for sale. You can actually do both at the same time. And authors like, like Cory Doctorow find that they actually get more sales by openly licensing their work and making it available for free than they do if they just keep the work closed and proprietary and copyrighted. You also have musicians like Jonathan Mann in the US who writes a, a song a day and puts it out under a Creative Commons license for anyone to listen to. Um, and through that whole process, he also now will do custom songs and you can actually, he actually is generating a living by writing custom songs for people now. And of course, you've got films coming out um, under open licenses. 
uh, Away from Keyboard, which was a Swedish film, actually invited people to remix the, f the ending and come up with a whole new movie ending than what it originally came out under. And, and uh, people like Jonathan Wirth, who's a photographer, also putting out his works under Creative Commons licenses and, and also still selling his work. So he's also following sort of what Cory Doctorow does, is a free version and a version also for sale. So I, I, I imagine that many of you have creative works that you have developed that could be contributed to the commons. And I expect that many of you are making use of creative works that you openly use as source material for your own creative practice. Because really, all of us as creators are building off the work of other creators, historically and in contemporary times. And so the commons has always played a critical role in the creative practice. So I'll give you a second without music to think about what you have that could go in the commons or what works you already are sourcing for your own creative practice. We'll just cover a couple of other last few spaces. I wanted to talk about data. I was really thrilled to see some work being done on data here at the Future Places Citizen Labs. And this one um, is a really fascinating area because what we're seeing is not only personal data, but government data. This chart shows on the right-hand side government departments like the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Energy, all of whom are collecting and generating vast amounts of data using public funds. And increasingly, governments are making that data open and accessible to others to make use of. And so on the left-hand side, what you're seeing are companies, whether they be in technology or finance or food and agriculture or healthcare, that are being able to generate their business and, um, and expand their business through the use of that data. We're also seeing initiatives like the Open Government Partnership, which is looking at which governments around the world are doing the most work on making their data open. And you can actually see rankings. So in this case, we can see that the United Kingdom, for example, is, is putting out a lot of data openly. So is Denmark, so is France, so is Finland. And so you can see the color coding is green as the data exists, it's digital, red is it's not public, the blue is it's unclear maybe free, so on. And in addition to sort of big government data collections that are being made open, we're also seeing some fascinating stuff happening on the personal data side, Fitbits, or this particular initiative, BioBeats, which is, which is really a whole mobile and machine learning platform that gives you biometric data that helps you assess your own well-being and potentially can be used to assess not only just one person's well-being, but a whole collection of people or even patients. And they're starting to consider the use of this to do things like um, lower insurance rates for people who are, from their biometric data, being more healthy in terms of their practices than other people. And then we have things like the Arduino board that was used for the, uh, for the lemon tree. and. Um, and this is a really interesting uh, whole area of sensor data that is uh, made with open source software and open hardware and can be used to actually collect and um, manage data on, on a whole wide range of practices. And all of these, uh, both hardware, software, and the data actually can end up feeding into the commons and being used in many, many different ways. So lots of personal and public data that uh, can be tracked and can be made open and can benefit all of us as a kind of global citizen in a global commons. And I also want to do quickly knowledge. And this maybe will be the last one that I do. I just recently came across this, which is called sharing vouchers. This is a whole informal approach to knowledge. Essentially, this group, they're actually in the Netherlands is creating a mechanism to help people share the knowledge that they have with other people. So a form of sharing of social capital, if you will. And to do so, they've created what they call the sharing voucher. 
The sharing voucher works like this. It's essentially a voucher. You can see an actual what it looks like right there. And it, it's essentially a gift. Essentially, you write on that sharing voucher what gift you have in the way of social capital or social knowledge or experience that you're willing to share with others. And others can actually write on that sharing voucher, they have a sort of slightly different version of it, something that they're actually looking for. And so they're actually creating these kind of hotspot spaces where sharing vouchers are posted, what people are looking for, what people are have, and you can connect people and enable them to help each other with no questions asked, no money being transacted. If you're, if you're contacted by someone and you can always refuse, you don't have to do it, but it's a form of giving, if you like, based on your social capital and your experience and knowledge. It's somewhat similar to this one, Seats to Meet, which is another very interesting initiative. I use this one in the workshop as well. Uh, but I like it because it's focused on work space sharing and meeting space sharing. So if you're looking to co-work in a shared workspace with other people, you can uh, find spaces using Seats to Meet. And it's free to go and co-work in that space. Uh, but when you go and co-work in that space, they actually ask you to register what experience you have and what experience you're looking for and they match make you with other people in that space so that you help others and others help you and that's the way that they kind of look for you to make a payment is not with money but with social capital and if you don't want to register yourself and what experience you have then you pay and they're also generating revenue because uh, in another way which is that uh, lots of new entrepreneurial ventures have started up out of seats to meet which they then physically rent space to or office space to. In the US, uh, there's been a huge emphasis on this knowledge area, especially uh, on this particular initiative, which is $2 billion initiative done by the Department of Labor to create what they call uh, high growth job opportunities for people who were displaced through outsourcing and free trade. And all of the resources that are being created by colleges under this initiative are being placed in Skills Commons as free open resources that anyone can access and use. And so what you're finding is a vast pool of educational content for areas like manufacturing, health, energy, transportation that are being made available through a website, skillscommons.org. And some of you probably are aware of MOOCs like edX and FutureLearn. Uh, these two are being new ways of distributing knowledge in a way that is free and open to all. It doesn't necessarily mean you get credit, but it's a whole new mechanism for distributing that knowledge compared to what universities have traditionally done. I mentioned uh, on the education side the sharing of knowledge from research, and these two are starting to be significant ways of creating large amounts of knowledge as part of a global commons. So I think the whole knowledge space has been fascinating as it's, it's become larger and we're seeing more and more uh, global sources of knowledge available in an open context to all of us. And I think all of us have knowledge that we can share in this fashion as well. So I'll close with a couple of things. Um, this shows the growth of Creative Commons licensed works over time from 50 million to 882 million last year. Uh, we expect it to go well over a billion this year. And so it's very interesting to see that people do want to share and are willing to share. And there's a tremendous growth of sharing through something like Creative Commons, even if it isn't necessarily baked into copyright law, there are mechanisms that allow us now to legally share. And, and when I think about the open business models and what I've been learning so far, Here's a few nuggets that represent the key takeaways from what we've been discovering at this point. So businesses that are openly sharing usually have some sort of social mission or see themselves as a social, social enterprise. They're not just about making money and maximizing profit. They actually are trying to deliberately make the world a better place. And almost all of them engage community in some way, either as um, contributors to the business as a mechanism to crowdsource, as a mechanism to market and build reputation, as a means to quickly and uh, quickly get users and to encourage those users to contribute to the company. 
And if they generate financial returns, they usually are sharing those with the community. They're not just keeping them all to themselves. And they're very much focused on maximizing abundance rather than creating artificial scarcity, a whole different way of thinking about creating a business. And I think most of them are also looking at the resources they create as gifts rather than commodities. And by that I mean a commodity is usually just something you buy in an anonymous fashion. You know, I bought this water from a store down the street. It's not like I developed a relationship with the, with the store vendor or they developed a relationship with me. But the open businesses tend to be very focused on more gifts and developing relationship with their customers and with their users in a deliberate way. And many of them are using multiple means of open, open content, open source software, open hardware, open data, open policy, all of these things packaged together to create a kind of larger, more open and entrepreneurial way of thinking about things that is totally based, not, to, not on closed, but on open. So I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for, uh, for entertaining this kind of ad alternative view of the world and contemplating what it's like to be a global citizen in a global commons. interesting that you uh, <coughs> referred to um, sidewalks and, and uh, uh, infrastructure as being something that's provided provided free for then businesses to operate on to generate to generate cash. <coughs> one of my one of my problems as a as a as a as a musician trying to live from from, from artifacts of music is 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 the reverse is becoming the case whereby <coughs> my content is becoming available for free. But the infrastructure is is what's is what's generating the cash. So, the I mean, literally dur during your talk, my 50 megabytes ran out on my phone of, of, of internet access. So they, they, I've got Virgin asking me for six quid to be able to talk to my girlfriend. And and so so what what's happening is that what I've created is now being used as a form of of uh, uh, of, of generating cash for people who make the phones, people who make the computers, people who make, make the infrastructure. I was just wondering how, how that squares with, with the, 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 the view of, the, of a better world, you know? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're touching on a really important uh, idea. Um, what I'm seeing is that we've increasingly marketized what were public services. Yeah, so yeah. we've taken things where we in the past would provide, say, transportation highways with public funds or, or provide public broadcasting bandwidth services uh, with public funds and we've marketized those and sold them off to some other entity to provide them for them from a, a kind of private sector perspective. And I think, that, I think that we need to revisit some of those ideas and make better decisions around what benefits who because we've really begun to see that We've kind of created the one percent that's getting super wealthy off of us, whereas in the past we really were being well, more well serviced by really the public on our behalf, and, and that's partly why I'm starting to look at the third way, which is how do we start to take personal ownership over making some of those changes, and trying to find services that better fit and serve us rather than some big corporate interest. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm really curious about your angle on personal data because you specify this <coughs> the new notion of the quantified self using biometric data, for instance, for insurance, uh, insurance company discounts, and this kind of business around the sharing of intimate, internal, personal data is something that has been described a lot as a scary development. And I'm really curious, uh, how does this play along with the openness agenda? Because yeah, it's a tricky subject. Yeah, I mean, I think this is another really interesting topic because in my view, we've historically been giving away our data, often very personal data, 
to a big organizations like Facebook and Google without really thinking about it. And now those organizations are monetizing and making huge amounts of profit based on our data. And so to what extent do we now start to reclaim that data back and start choosing services that don't do that or allow us to control our data in a way that better suits our needs? I think these are critical decisions in, in contemporary digital society that we need to be thinking about and we need to take more control over ourselves deliberately and manage how we want to be tracked and how we want to, what we want to share and who we want to share it with in different ways than we have before. So I'm actually all for more personal self-control over what we choose to share and who we choose to share it with and less of this automatic, yes, I agree, you can track me and you can use all my data for whatever reasons you want. I think that that kind of practice is something that uh, we readily agreed to in the early days of the web, but I think as we move forward, there'll be less and less of that. 